Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. It's evening here in London and the sky is somewhat cloudy and overcast and it's twilight. So I've got Sir William Cash here and I find that he presents his debates extremely well. So let me open it uh, here. Sir William Cash, the speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, I've already made my remarks with regard to the methodology that's been employed in respect of this bill. I think it is reprehensible. I think it is a constitutional revolution. And I also believe that it is a very, very undesirable precedent. Um, the right honourable member for West Dorset, at the beginning of his, toward in his remarks, did say, um, I don't think I misrepresent him in any way, that really the responsibility, it was in his concluding remarks, the responsibility for all this, somehow or other, is those uh, like myself who are against <coughs> the idea of the withdrawal agreement and matters relating to that, and that in a way I think he implied or certainly said that we were responsible for this. I would say it was quite the opposite. I would say it actually, there was something of the order of 30 colleagues, and I say this with great respect to them, they are entitled to say what they want and do what they like in a certain fashion. But I think actually, in terms of the enormity of what my right honourable friend has been seeking to achieve, and in this business motion would continue to do so, is actually doing something which is profoundly undemocratic because of the following reason. The precedence that is given understanding for Order 14 to government business is one of the rocks of our parliamentary system. Why? Because we have a system of parliamentary government. We have a system of democratic government. We have a reason for the rule, which is Standing Order 14, and that convention, as applied by the standing order, gives precedence to government business for a very, very simple reason. It is this, and I say it in all reasonableness. It is because if a government takes office, because the Queen has agreed that that person does take office, it follows that Her Majesty's government has got a majority and or has got a sufficient degree of confidence to be able to carry the business of the of the, wait a minute, the business of the House. And the reality is, that is the Constitutional Convention and that is what our standing order says. So to, no, I will not. Uh, to, to rip it up, is, which is basically what he is doing, I think is extremely undemocratic and, if I may so, say so, unparliamentary because it actually goes to the heart of whether or not the business in this House is conducted in line with the wishes of those who voted either in general elections or in this case by virtue of the Referendum Act itself where the Sovereign Act of Parliament gave the decision to the British people and then effectively the, the proposed motion and the shenanigans that goes with it takes back the control over that business and gives it back to members of Parliament who have no legitimacy whatsoever to make the decisions which are actually given by them, by their own vote, by six to one in this House, to the British people. That is a very simple constitutional point, and I don't think anybody can dispute it. If they wish to dispute it, will they be kind enough to get up? Yes, of course. And the Honourable Member for giving way, does the, does the Honourable Member not accept that he's trying to have it both ways? Whether or not we accept, uh, we believe that the Constitution is currently perfect, which I do not, um, either the government is capable of delivering decisions, or if the government is incapable of forming a majority and making vital decisions, then surely it is incumbent on the members of parliament to find ways to do so. Absolutely. Yeah. I could not disagree more, because the manner in which this is being done, as I've already pointed out, is to legislate in circumstances which would, as I said yesterday on the point of order, Mr Speaker, would ram through all these arrangements, there is going to be no practical opportunity today to actually make amendments and to get them tabled, discussed and voted on because of the grouping system that we have under our procedures. So for practical purposes, important amendments, and I say to the Honourable Lady from Pontypract and Wakefield, if that's the right expression, the fact is that it is a shambolic bill. I mean, the number of things that have to be changed in it, I mean, references to Acts of Parliament that don't exist. I mean, it is it, 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 alleging that sections are in force 
when they're not. It is a most unbelievable shambles, this bill. And the reality is there is no excuse for it. They've had uh, the previous number four bill for some time, and they've suddenly decided to accelerate this procedure to try to make some kind of uh, uh, political advantage at undermining the decision of the House in the Withdrawal Act uh, of 2018, which is the repeal of the 1972 Act, which is related in turn to Exit Day. That Exit Day has been moved forward by a statutory instrument. I personally think it is unlawful, but that's a, a separate question, not for today. Uh, actually, the repeal of the 72 Act, on which everything depends, including the anchor of the referendum itself, because that is what it is, it has to go in lockstep with Exit Day. So moving Exit Day doesn't in fact pre prevent the repeal of the 72 Act. And what I can say is that that has uh, a, a fundamental relevance to what is going on today. Now, the next point I would make is this. The real question is who governs this country? That is what Standing Order 14 is all about. And I have to say that, the, that, that, it, that the, I noticed the member for Sandbach having a bit of a laugh there, because actually we all, we all I, I, just, just, one, just one moment, if I may finish my, my, my initial response, I have to say that there are some difficulties arising on that question right now. But actually the, government, the government's business understanding for Order 14 gives the right to the British people in line with the majority it does exist. I give way. Points of doubt. I think I'm right in surmising, or, or simply stating to the House, that Sandbach is indeed a place. Uh, but the Honourable Lady, and indeed is not all that far from where the Honourable Lady represents, but she is, of course, Antoinette Sandbach, the Honourable Lady, the member for Edisbury. Yeah. Antoinette Sandbach. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm very grateful for, for allowing the intervention because I had always thought that it was a principle that it is Parliament that has ultimate sovereignty in the UK. Well, that, 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 that is absolutely the fundamental doctrine. All I'm saying to the Honourable Lady, and I've said it to the House many times, is that when, by a solemn act of a sovereign Parliament, we transfer the decision by six to one in this House to the British people, that is the act of sovereignty which they then have transferred to them to make the decision. It's as simple as that. I will give way. Giving way. Is it not the case that no Prime Minister is above the people, no Member of Parliament is above the people, and no Parliament is above, above the people, and we are all supposed to be servants of the people? Yeah, I agree with everything that the Honourable Gentleman has said. But the reality is that in these special circumstances, it's about who governs, it's about sovereignty, and the sovereignty was given to the people on this particular question by Acts of Parliament, as well as by their intrinsic right to vote in general elections. Now, the, the next and last point I wish to make is regard to the question of constitutional comparisons, and I'd simply like to, to, to refer to a number of bills where uh, in, on previous occasions we have had a similar sort of procedure. Uh, the, re, the Northern Ireland legislation to which the Speaker referred, I think, in a point of order yesterday, uh, is something of a particular case, but it is not of the same type as the sort of legislation that we're dealing with here. There was also a, an occasion of the War Crimes Bill. There was the Parliament Act itself, uh, there is also uh, a series of other, uh, there was a hunting act, which I don't think really falls into this category because it was a different sort of bill. The real point I'm making is that when you're making judgments about constitutional matters, the question is one of apples and pears. It's whether there is a distinct constitutional difference. Now, the point I make in general terms is that there is a very specific constitutional difference between this bill and the other bills to which the shortened accelerated procedure has in fact been applied. And indeed, these matters were considered uh, by the House of Lords Constitution Committee, where they themselves were deeply critical about the speed with which certain bills relating to Northern Ireland were dealt with. So the, 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 the real essence of the problem here is that this is contradictory. This does this situation that we're now faced with does contradict with the precedents, 
And I do think that the uh, fact that this bill is so shambolic and so badly drafted and actually can only apparently be, be, be amended, practically speaking. I think I heard the member for West Dorset suggest these amendments are going to be done in the undemocratic House of Lords. I mean, for heaven's sake, uh, it, the, the House of Lords is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a body which doesn't really, I think, in matters of this kind, have the kind of status the House of Commons has got, if I put it no higher than that. Yes, of course I will. Well, Member, uh, given what he's saying about the House of Lords, will he join us at some sub subsequent time in reforming it? The Honourable Gentleman is in for a pleasant surprise. I've been talking about reforming the House of Lords on and off for the last 20 years, uh, and I believe it is necessary. Uh, but le leaving that aside, because I really don't think that is directly relevant to this particular point. So we have the um, the, the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Ex Exercise of Functions Bill 2017. Then we also have the uh, War Crimes Bill, the European Parliamentary Elections Act 1998. And the, um, I mentioned the Hunting Act, which I don't think is strictly relevant to this. But the interesting thing is, Mr. Speaker, that in the case of the War Crimes Bill and the European Parliamentary Act, uh, Parliamentary Act the, uh, nine, the Parliament Act 1911 became involved. Now, this is very interesting, I think, for the following reason, that that, of course, applies uh, a great deal of delay to a bill and that is very relevant to this particular case. And therefore, I think I'm right in saying that the reason they've adopted this is to speed it up in order to be able to avoid any delay in the bill, because that then would take us beyond April the 12th, for example, as a result of which there then wouldn't be the opportunities to which they wish to, they wish to, prevent, to, to avail themselves. Um, there are some further ones, the Parliament Act 1949, and then in 1914, there was the uh, Defence of the Realm Bill, uh, which was a completely different context again, where it is quite clear that in the Defence of the Realm Bill, it was, dealt, it was dealt with in a very rapid way because it was so urgent in the context of fighting the First World War. This is another kind of war. It is a war on pieces of paper. And I have to say that I think that this is part of our biggest problem, that we're fighting a battle about who governs this country, who is in fact going to be able to determine the outcome. If you look, Mr. Speaker, at the question, for example, of how the laws will be made under the rubric of the European treaties on the basis that we go back in the transitional period for a number of years, the number of years varies from two years to four. But on that basis, Mr. Speaker, this House, as I said the other day, will be politically castrated. It will not be able to do anything. I speak as Chairman of the European Scrutiny Committee. It will not be able to do anything, as things stand, to be able to influence any law in any field of any competence within the EU treaties. And it means that we will effectively be governed by the majority vote in the Council of Ministers. So this bill is indicative of the kind of problems that we're up against. This is not a, an expedited bill. It is not an accelerated bill. It is a bill of constitutional execution. It means that we will not be able, as a result of the procedures followed, and the procedures which will follow from the fact that this withdrawal agreement will eventually end up, if it was to go through, by allowing 24 other, 27 other countries to legislate for us. We will have no right to veto any of those laws as things stand. And that is, to me, the greatest reasonable reason and objection to that proposal. Furthermore, the Northern Ireland Block, the, the, the Northern Ireland backstop is part of that control of law situation. So I think this is a really grave moment in our constitutional history. I think it is a, a reprehensible bill. I don't think it should pass. I think it's a disgrace that it was brought in. And I have to say that I have to say this, that 30 members of my own party are responsible for this, uh, because otherwise it would never have got through as a result of the combination of votes with the other side of the House. So I regard this as a grave constitutional indictment of those who have been responsible for bringing it in. That was Sir William Cash. This is Catania Alvin saying God bless and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.